So uh, just to introduce myself and my colleagues. So I'm Joe Diamond. I'm the Communications Outreach Officer here at the SKA. We have uh, Martin and Kate Hadfield, who are both the uh, Creative and Studio Directors at Carbon Creative, which is a digital design agency just up the road in Manchester. So they're the real pros here. I'm just... Oh. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> so hopefully everyone online, you can, you can hear us. I think I uh, did get a thumbs up from some of you. But um, all right, we'll start the session. So uh, if you want to show your screen. Sure. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Can everyone online see it okay as well? Yep. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Nice. Cool. Uh, I might have to put my glasses on and off for this. We'll see how we get on. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm um, Martin. I'm the creative director at Carbon Creative. Um, I've worked with Joe for, gosh, eight years. About eight years, yeah. So. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hello. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm the creative director at Carbon Creative. We're a, we're a branding and digital agency. So we do work for lots of different clients. Obviously, we love working with SKAO. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got some things to talk through today. I'm going to cover the sort of strategy around graphic design and the concepts around graphic design. So a bit more sort of uh, higher level, maybe a little bit boring. I'll try not to be boring. We'll see how we get on. So, um, so I guess what is graphic design? So graphic design is the art of combining words and pictures into a visual message. And its primary purpose is to communicate an idea, product or service in a more engaging and memorable way than using language alone. So one of the purest forms of graphic design and my preferred form of graphic design to be fair is conceptual advertising. Um, and the best graphic designers, um, they create ads with more than just words and pictures. They craft designs um, that grab attention and set a tone and stir viewers' emotions. And that's quite hard to do. So it's kind of storytelling. So, but what I wanted to do is like, um, maybe let's start by taking a look behind the curtain at some really good ads from uh, history and then we can get an idea of how great advertising and graphic design works together. So I'm going to start with one of my favourite brands, which is um, Apple. So we're going to look at the core of Apple design and how basically they went from the brink of bust to billions in the bank um, using the art of simplicity. So some of you may have seen these ads previously. They were from over 20 years ago now, actually, so quite, quite, quite far back. And when Steve Jobs returned to Apple in 1997, the company was three months away from bankruptcy, and the Mac had only 4% market share, um, which was a fraction compared to the PC market. Uh, the PC market basically dominated. So, and to be fair, it still does. Um, but Mac has made in roads. Um, but at that time, Mac users were feeling really marginalized. So Jobs, Steve Jobs hired a, a advertising agency um, called Chef Ailey. Um, and uh, they turned that sort of negative of Mac being a minority, if you like, into a positive. Um, and their proposition in that was that Apple and its Mac users were not just run of the mill PC users. Um, because they just thought differently. They bought a computer for a different reason. So, um, and the Think Different campaign, which was this, started that trend by portraying Mac users and Apple as thinking differently by using like photography of, um, you know, scientists, creatives and artists um, and that turned the kind of whole thinking of that think differently into you're a smart, you, you know, you, you're a smart, you make the smart choice if you buy Apple. So it was the intelligent choice to buy Apple. And the graphic design that they used in those ads was really simple. So it was just taking historic portraits, making them black and white, using that campaign slogan of think different. 
which isn't grammatically correct, interestingly, so it should really be think differently, but it, they, they use think different um, for whatever reason they decided to do that. Um, however, the whole campaign was highly successful and it set a kind of um, precedent for the advertising and the products that they were going to bring forward into the future. So it set a sequence for, for these new products to come. So that was the Think Different campaign, and it was a brand awareness campaign. And then quickly following on the tails of that was um, this ad, which was for um, a revolutionary new computer. So they started a little bit of a product revolution in, in the PC computer market. Um, so um, this, the launch of this Mac was um, obviously radically different to any other personal computer that came before it. And I just wanted to get on under the skin of this ad and give you some tips and tricks as to how this ad was created and, and what it was about. So if we do a bit of a dissection of this ad, so the first thing that we have in this ad is obviously the, the, the thing that grabs your attention, which is we would call an attraction image or a hero image often are we often called to um, and the the reason that this obviously it was a product image but one of the big things was it was very different so it was like it was a, a colorful computer which hadn't come before so um, it's not a beige pc it was a it was a bright different computer so they showcased that with the photography on a on a white background the next thing that was used in this ad was the conceptual headlines. So um, they're kind of playing to the um, the coolness of Apple here by saying, you know, it was setting a tone. Max are cool, PCs maybe not so cool at the time. Um, this is Apple speaking, not me, by the way, if there's any PC users here. Um, but Apple was declaring style war on the PC, on the PC market, because they had to they had to declare war with, with uh, IBM and Microsoft to try and win back some market share. So it was, it was a really clever headline, she cannot be. And um, that was followed up by descriptive body copy. Um, so, and this gives users more detail and it amplifies the benefits of this particular product. So um, amplifying the benefit of this new iMac, what it has to offer basically everything built in, you plug it in and you get on the internet, which was quite revolutionary at the time because prior to that, you had to basically buy a PC, buy a modem, buy the connection, ethernet ports, all that sort of stuff. So this was like a plug and go sort of scenario. And then finally, we have what we call call to action and brand identity. So, um, and they back up that brand identity with that Think Different message. So that Think Different campaign that came before it was followed through on all their advertising thereafter. So the reason I'm showing you these ads is because they follow a pattern of like um, really good advertising where you have your hero image, a conceptual headline that works really well with that image. You descriptive body copy that tells you a little bit more about the product, a call to action to tell you where to go to find out more about it, and branding, who makes it, where does it come from. These are like classic advertising graphic design um, methodologies for, for producing an advert. So if we look a bit deeper into it, into the actual mechanics of the layout, so you'll notice that the entire ad is white, and this was playing to Apple's sort of zen-like simplicity. So the product is, they're putting product first and foremost in the, in the ad. And um, so they put it on a white background and that emphasizes as sort of zen philosophy to, to product design. It uses something called rule of thirds. So rule of thirds, you, some of you may or may not be aware of, but the ad pitches the, the, the main product in two thirds of the image, leaving the right hand side free for uncluttered um, headline 
messaging and that makes it kind of really simple and easy for the viewer to, to read. So the image is hooking people in, the headline then, you know, gives them a, a glint of more info. The descriptive copy tells them what the product's about, how it works, and then the call to action hopefully gets them to take action on it. The other thing on this, uh, a good thing to, to consider when you're creating an advert or a graphic design piece is that when you have a subject, whether that's an inanimate object like a computer, or it could be a person, is to always try and make sure that your photography looks into the image, uh, looks into the headline. So, because what that does is it it, it, um, it creates that connection when you look at the image first, because that's what grabs your attention, and then your eye naturally goes across to the to the headline and reads the headline image. And that's why rule of thirds as a concept work, works quite well. So if you have a you know a person, a portrait image of a person, or a, it could be a telescope dish looking at something, your headline should be to the right of that because that will draw your eye across that headline. So, so yeah. So that was that ad. That was Apple revolutionizing the computer industry. Um, and then they went on to revolutionize the music industry. And it started, this was their second big product. It was the iPod. So, and again, this, I just wanted to show you the advertising for, for Apple's iPod on this. It follows the same pattern. So we have an attraction image. So something that catches your attention. Conceptual uh, headline. So on this, they're saying it's a brand new product. So they're saying, say hello to iPod. Um, following on from the success of the iMac, I became the big statement that they would use for all their products going forward. The descriptive body copy. Now on this one, this one's really clever as a, as a sort of sub message headline, I think, because at the time products that were available at the time could only like hold, there were MP3 players already out there, but the big thing for the iPod was it had a mini hard drive inside it and the iPod could hold a thousand songs, which, which was unheard of at the time. So um, it was a clever way to word that for a consumer to understand a thousand songs in your pocket. So it's basically saying this device can hold a thousand songs for your entire music library and it'll fit in your pocket. Nothing like that had ever been invented before. Or if it had, it hadn't been brought to market in the way Apple brought it to market. So it was, it was a clever line, a clever one-liner. And then we have the branding again. Um, reinforcing their Think Different campaign. So in other words, what they're basically saying there is, we're Apple, we think different, our consumers are smart, they buy, they make the smart choice. And then their third and final big, big product, which uh, revolutionized another industry, was of course the iPhone. So this was the point where Apple had started to see major success and got out of the problems that they were in before. So the iMac and the iPod basically reinvented the company more as a consumer company, consumer electronics company, rather than just a computer company. Um, they actually dropped the moniker of Apple computers around this time as well, and renamed the company just Apple. So that was their commitment saying we'd do more consumer stuff. Um, so the iPhone was obviously uh, a really revolutionary product that changed a lot, changed a lot in consumer electronics. So, but their ads followed that same super simplicity. So that very Zen-like um, uh, adoption of Apple's design for philosophy as a whole. So um, again, so you'll notice that at the top now, we've just got Apple iPhone. So we've dropped the thing different. They didn't need that anymore. They've prove themselves as thinking different as far as the, their concern, their consumers are concerned. Oops, sorry, can you see that? Let's go back. Um, we have the attraction image. Again, on this one, the, the photography is really good because what it does is it showcases the phone for what it's best at. It, it was a phone that had a big display. It uses touch gesture. So what they've done in the photography there is they've used motion blur where you can see the hand moving. 
So that was something, again, there was no touch enabled devices available at the time, so it's revolutionary. Um, so the photography was really well um, thought through. Um, they've got their conceptual headline there, touching is believing, again, really cleverly thought through. Um, their call to action, revolutionary um, iPhone, is now available at Apple, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so the point of all those three ads is they all follow a pattern. So, and the pattern is really good um, uh, attraction image, hero image, really good headlines. So thinking through your headlines is really important. And then the, the rest of it is mechanical. So sub messaging and a call to action and branding. So, so I just want to recap on those. So the iMac, the iPad, the iPhone, they were all revolutionary um, products. Um, they revolutionized personal computing, music and telecommunications, um, and they propelled Apple from the edge of bankruptcy to a billion dollar company, one of the highest value companies in the world. Clearly, it, it was all down to cleverly considered product design, but also really well executed and considered graphic design and advertising. That drove that consumer awareness. Without the advertising and you know graphic design that went into those promoting those products, they probably never would have made it as big as they have because other competitors would have got there quickly. So it was the, it was the marketing that really pushed them forward. So to give you a quick recap on, on the um, secret source for beautiful graphic design and, um, and advertising. Um, these are my sort of top seven tips. So, and the biggest one by far, because um, I work with lots of graphic designers at Carbon, I head up that graphic design team. And the biggest thing so, uh, by far is write a creative brief and write your own creative brief. So if someone sends you a creative brief or you send one out, just spend a lot of time getting that creative brief right because it grounds you and it's your Bible for the entire project. It's easy in graphic design to go, if you're a creative, it's easy to go down a rabbit hole and start designing things and like you kind of like go off a little tangents because that's the way you do when you're a graphics person. You find something and you like it and you go down that route. But the creative brief totally grounds you in that process. So it makes sure that you can always refer back to well, what was what is who is my audience what do they want to think feel you know know about this product or service etc so really i can't emphasize that enough write a creative brief i'm going to share a creative brief after this um uh discussion uh later today that you can use if you want to and um, that's my personal brief that i use for all my projects um, and then you can maybe use it if you wish to. Um, always follow brand and identity. So if there are guidelines on that stuff already, so if you have guidelines in place for um, uh, branding, colors, uh, fonts, all that sort of stuff, um, and mechanical stuff, obviously make sure you follow it. Guidelines are guidelines. They can be broken is the wrong word, but you can bump up the size of them. So because some brand guidelines are very prescriptive, we know because we write them as well. Um, and we actually worked on SKA, SKAO's brand guidelines, but it's okay to bump against those guidelines a little bit and push things and that, that's acceptable. Definitely always use on any sort of piece of marketing that you can um, use it some form of really good and powerful attractive imagery and think really, really hard about a compelling headline that works well with that imagery, because that's what, that's the hook that gets people, it draws them in, and that's what gets people to look at that image and find out more. If it's, they look at something and they think, um, I, I've got something to figure out here, um, psychologically, the best ads work that way, where you've got a really um, image that makes you cure, curious, and then the headline that backs that up. So. I, I would always say spend the most amount of your time thinking about that image and headline and how those two beautiful things work together. Um, so yeah, attraction imagery, a compelling headline, descriptive copy is the bit that does the mechanical stuff that just tells them a bit more about what that product or service is. 
um, your call to action is what takes that person on that journey after the advert in some way. And then finally, um, yeah, using sort of like principles of graphic design just to make sure the mechanical feel of that ad is correct. Um, and that's the bit where we're gonna hand over to Joe, I think, so we can Brilliant. talk through it. Okay. So, over. So, yes, so as Martin was alluding to, uh, the principles of graphic design, so how we actually use those principles to create our layouts and create compelling kind of like outreach or marketing materials for, for ourselves. So what are these principles? So obviously it ranges in, in scope, but we've kind of put seven down on a, on paper, but no, either more or less, uh, depending on where you're reading. Many, them. many. Yeah. yeah. These are the seven that we think are probably going to help you the best. So start off with uh, symmetry. So symmetry, as you know, is a natural world is, is full of symmetry, and so we're all quite attracted to uh, symmetric in designs and well, things in, in real life as well. But when we um, look at symmetry itself, you have symmetry versus asymmetry as well. So this is an example right now of how that works and how they both can be combined on the same layout. So you have a nice, let's say, at the very top, nice symmetric kind of design. Then at the bottom, you see how um, it's asymmetric as well with the text and how we've laid that out there. So it, it is quite subjective, but um, you want to try and use one or the other, or if not both, in your designs and, and how you lay it out. So then after that, so that's the first principle, we go on to uh, scale. So scale, as we know, uh, can be used in graphic design to kind of create drama and emphasis in what you're trying to portray. So in these two designs, we've used graphic uh, scale to um, kind of conceptually emphasize different points. So um, we should have used uh, the, uh, the blue dots posters. We uh, should have. <laughs> but, um, as you know from Carl Sagan, the, uh, the pale blue dots and blue planet, obviously from Attenborough, they've used these designs like, with, like let's say, with the large blue circle, um, on the large scale of problem, like the human impact on planet Earth, and then the second uses kind of like a smaller circle, so full stop, so with the pale blue dots right there. So that's obviously the uh, the quote from uh, from Carl Sagan about the insignificance of what we are. As, as, as Earth, when they first took those images from, I think it was from Voyager, out, out uh, uh, many years ago. So as they've shown here with these examples, scale is quite important to highlight what they're trying to convey, from a small blue dot of the Earth to the magnificent blue planets and problems that we're facing <laughs> over time. Sure. But um, after that, so after scale, we get on to color theory. So what I've shown here on the slide, so it's obviously it's, yeah, the human perception of color can obviously influence your tone and the tone of your designs as well. Uh, so we wanted to try and show you that there are there's some free services to use. So Adobe has some great tools for, uh, for this. So what kind of colors are popular? And we can give you the source material on this, but these are the most popular colors used uh, by, by us right? in, in the world. So you start off with blue which you might have seen is also used by NHS and Twitter and Barclays and whatnot. Then you go on to, uh, to green, then you go on to purple, red, which is surprisingly lower than I thought it was going to be, to be yeah, honest. It's only about 6%, I think. 6% yeah. use it. Then you get orange, uh, then after orange you get the multicolor, and then obviously after multicolor you get more to the white and black, so you get more neutral. So these are kind of like the 10, like I said, the more, the more popular colors that are used. In, uh, in design. Um, obviously, as, as, as we all know, as, as I mentioned before, it's all very subjective. It's interesting um, how blue and green are the, are the like, most favorite colors in the world, though. Exactly. So, and I guess that's down to, you know, the blue sea, blue sky, green, yeah. I mean, there'll be green some, fields. Um, yeah, yeah and some psychology world. built around this as well, so we're sure. all actually kind of like leaning towards. But um, these are the general colors that I use uh, throughout the day. But obviously, when, when Martin again alluded to with your brand guidelines, you want to try and keep to the general colors that are described in that. But if you haven't got those, then obviously whatever works best for yourself. But then when it comes to uh, kind of like the more modern use 
of, um, of layout kind of like principles, we have grids. So grids obviously bring structure and efficiency to kind of like designing a page. So the more typical kind of design is this uh, four column grid. So you using whatever tools you have, and we use uh, a lot of InDesign, like Adobe InDesign to create some like our contact magazine or other publications. When you set up your page, by having your grid set up beforehand, it allows you to better kind of look how you want to place your, your information or your content. I can give you an example of this. So not only do you have your, your columns, we you have your rows and you can set this up properly again in your whatever tool that you use. But by setting kind of like the guides um, for like your rows and your, your columns it helps, as I mentioned, define the, uh, the positioning of your objects or your content. And Kate, you made us a while ago some templates for our posters where uh, you've where you kind of like set these grid principles. And it's been very useful for us to not only when we make one piece of content, but when we try and copy that content, so let's say for the parry poster or the cat poster in the future, they, they there's usually like a set principles that they can't kind of follow. It all kind of looks the same over time. You'll see this with most posters you see or any communications that we might do with our social media. Um, and then this is a, an example of how you can then figure out how you want to put those assets on your grid. It's just, just as I was mentioning before, so it gives you a good idea where to place it. And it kind of cleans up as well, allows you to have those clean margins, whilst also having those nice spaces between the content as well. So grids, as you two mentioned, maybe were um, not, I know. not taught back in, the, back in your time. Back in but, the uh, day. It's more like, <laughs> back in the day, but it's more of a modern kind of approach. It is. So especially with websites as well. Websites yeah. use a lot of grids. So. And so I can give you an example now with like the power poster, um, how we maybe set out like the day the, uh, of what's going on. So it's quite, quite clean uh, structure to the content. So you have the title set across um, those principles. It's a bit different, diff different principle here, but um, the third principle as well. So that's still quite two thirds maybe, but obviously it's, a, it's a three quarters, but it still has that like, same principle. And obviously you've got your clean boxes for your, 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 your title and your um, more mechanical information. And then obviously at the bottom, you have your, uh, your day structure. For, so this is a good, good way to, um, to present your information. So then we got onto uh, lines and frames. So they're generally used to better organize your content, almost like grids are but it's more for the, um, the user though, like the, whoever's looking at your, your material to better differentiate between the, uh, the concepts that are on whatever, whatever you're producing. So I'll give you an example of this. So if I have my, uh, my small line here, but my larger line there. So the, uh, oh, I want to say hello to Paul. So he's, hello, he's, he's our hello. photographer, so just be taking a, Anyone on a witness protection program? Like <laughs> <that>? <laughs> You'll be showing these photos at the back of the next one. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> but as I was just uh, mentioning, so when it comes to lines and frames, so I've used a kind of small line to differentiate between the logos and the, um, like the speakers and the dates. And I've got a larger line at the bottom there to uh, kind of like separate and punctuate kind of like the different content types. It helps draw the eye as well to those different areas as well. So I would encourage to, to use these kind of concepts in whatever you make. So like, especially when you're detailing information as well, so it draws the eye, allows people to really better know where to look. A bit like what Martin was saying, how like the titling was, was across from the, uh, the hero image to draw your attention to that. Yeah. And uh, you can even do it, um, with filled in boxes or frames. So as you see here, we've highlighted the Parry conference, um, just Parry 2022, with a nice kind of like blue faded box. So that's how you more frame your content. So rather than use the lines to, uh, to frame your, your kind of detailed content, you can use these frames to better illustrate and highlight text or imagery in a much more kind of like visual outstanding way. So again, it draws the eyes in specific areas that you want it to be in. And it, and it generally just helps to organize your content. So, you know, so we're all in the end visual learners and 
think this kind of concept that helps understand that. And then uh, we go on to, um, again, you can use outline frames as well. So we have a, so if you're using like a tool like InDesign or Illustrator, you can set strokes for your frames and rather than having a filled in frame. And again, it better highlights the, uh, or an isolate the contents as well for a, a better reading. Then we go on to use of negative space. So negative space is a difficult one to, um, to get right. Uh, but when done well, it looks fantastic. So you can create quite clever and conceptual, like kind of like imagery with deeper uh, meaning hidden in its like plain sight. I'll show some examples of this right now. So it's used for like, illustrations here. So obviously you can see from like the white backgrounds, we now have these illustrations on top, making use of that negative space illustrating this this penguin in quite 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 a great way brilliantly brilliantly yeah so this these were illustrations made by was it no Nova no Nova bar yeah it says so um, famous israeli illustrator he actually works in london but uh yeah he's brilliant yeah, and he's, he's used these uh these ads creatively so again we'll have another concept here so uh and so you can see how the um, the image kind of like intelligently intelligently complements Kind of like the headline messaging around uh yeah so again you've got the penguin with uh, the air freezers the energy cost and then obviously you've got the uh groceries now shop for people and then we have one more here how food is now prepared for space so <laughs> great advert this kind of like elegant simplicity with a deep concept that's quite difficult to achieve but when things look simple and effortless it usually yeah it comes through in a fantastic way as presented here these adverts. So, but negative space again, it is a hard one to do. But if you can't achieve it with whatever idea that you're using, it can be used in a very effective way. And this is done uh, with our even our own logo. So you'll see with the um, our pictorial mark here, we've used the negative space to highlight kind of like the almost like the Big Bang, the star. Uh, going to Big Bang and also the, the Southern Constellation in our logo. So we're using negative space effectively there. And we've done the same for our actual logo as well. You can see that transition was quite nice. I can see how that negative space is used effectively. So I'll go back again and just show that one more time. Um, so you see here, and you see how that middle one then uses that space to form into our full logo. So that, that's a kind of like a simple explanation of how that negative space can be used effectively. So the final concept before I hand over to Kate, because I think you know we're running on time, which is great. And then we'll have some questions at the end as well. So we want to try and make sure we save some time for that. Would be typography. So as we all know, uh, we use typography every day in our, in our emails or our documentation or making a brochure or a poster or anything. So there's many types of typefaces, but broadly speaking, uh, these will be the main category. So you have the most used ones, the classic. Uh, so these were created, um, yeah, more decorative kind of like applications of it, rather than the ones that were created with, with PCs at the time. Yeah, serif and sans serif, those are the main two types. Yeah. So serifs have got the kind of little ascender uh, bits, and then your sans serif is like Helvetica. So serif is like times, and that's sans serif by uh, Helvetica. True maestro in typography. <laughs> And then you have more kind of like display fonts, which are kind of used for like kind of advertising campaigns, give it a bit more of a human feel to it rather than a computer feel. Then you have these old kind of like ones that were made originally for computers and things, for typewriters, back in the days of the soft type and modern space. So typography is obviously very important. Again, if you have your brand guidelines, you might have a specific font that your organization uses. But um, again, it's down to you subjectively what you want to use the best get across your message, whether it's something a bit more like a display font, which is a bit more human or dramatic, or you have something more classically used, which um, is more probably enjoyable for, for kind of like the greater audience. And this could be uh, showing examples of how this is used in like a poster for like a power poster. So typically, um, when you're doing graphic design, you don't want to use more than two type fonts. If you have something that's like five or six of them, it just, it looks messy and it's harder to like, kind of like understand and to visually enjoy. So usually you want to use two fonts or less. 
Um, so as you see here, we've used two uh, for the, um, the main title and then the uh, more mechanical title underneath. And um, sometimes selecting a, a, a font for a project is um, like on this one, we did select a slab serif. This, these were just conceptualized and never saw the light of day to be fair. But um, we used the slab serif because it was it felt more editorial. Yeah. So um, so it's more like a typewriter type font. That, that font is actually called American Typewriter. So, but it was because we wanted to give the ad a bit of an edi editorial feel. So that's why we chose that particular ad and that uh, typeface. Sorry, and that's the beauty of advertising. Sometimes you can use different. You can bounce against the brand guidelines a little bit and use a different display face for things to give it feel for what it should be. Brilliant. So that's the general kind of like design principles when we're coming to your layouts. And now Kate is going to show you how to do that. Well, I know we might leave you a little, uh, little, yeah, yeah. little challenge for yourselves. I'll hand over to Kate and then after this we'll do a bit of a Q&A, set you your little challenge for the next few days and we'll walk you down to the next, uh, next session. Lovely. Yeah, we're going we'll, to, we'll do yeah, 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 we've got to swap seats. Do you want me to sort that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're just going to spend the last sort of 10 minutes just talking through how you can possibly put all of those principles into practice. I'm not, I'm not actually sure how versed you all are in using different types of software. I mean, is anybody kind of used to using like highly creative software or is it more kind of like your, uh, Microsoft, PowerPoint, Word and things like that? Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. So, um, so just going to sort of chat through the different types of software because um, as an agency, we obviously use uh, Adobe software, um, Illustrator, InDesign and Photoshop is what we actually absolutely swear by, as you can imagine. But there are actually um, software platforms online that you can actually access free of charge as well. So we're going to just talk through a few um, principles of how you could actually use something called Adobe Express. Does anybody actually use Adobe Express already? I've used it a couple of times. But oh, not you're really probably more expert than me, so this is perfect. So if I get stuck... Does anyone use Canva? Oh. Anybody use Canva? Yeah. You knew everyone had used Canva. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very, it's very similar to Canva, actually. Um, Canva. Yeah, it is. And, and Canva is a, a very helpful tool, and it kind of gives you all of the um, sort of basic principles that you need to make just those um, sort of everyday assets, anything from social media assets through to posters, leaflets, anything that's pretty much sort of single page. So, but we've actually put together a library of um, sample templates that you can actually use throughout the Perry conference and uh, Joe's going to share that um, with you all so that it's actually a public link you can go on. If you don't already have um, access to Adobe Express you can just register as a free user. The basic um, membership is pretty much gives you access to thousands of templates, fonts, imagery, um, design assets. If you do choose to upgrade, if you want to get more um, experimental with it. One of the big, um, I'd say, benefits to being a pay, having a paid subscription is you can actually um, upload your own brand as well. So, so you can have your own logo and fonts and color palette on there just for absolute speed and mm. ease when you're making any templates. So, um, so yeah, so this, this is Adobe Express. And sorry, I've got to put my glasses on now because I need to look back at the screen. Um, so, uh, oh, just quickly as well, yeah, about the actual subscription, if you did choose to go to premium, and this is actually logged in as premium, it is actually only £100 a year, so it's pr pretty inexpensive for what is actually a very good creative tool. So this is the um, home dashboard, very easy, sort of like super user friendly to sort of like navigate around. So at the top, you've got the... Um, different types of projects that you can create. So like I said, anything for social media, your posters, you can even design logos on this. Um, if you're having an event, you might want to design your invitations or your uh, menus or anything for your events on here too. Um, you've got some very quick actions as well. So this is like the very popular actions which you have here on the home to ash so even with the uh, free subscription you can actually use most of these anyway so take for example i'm just going to attempt to do some little actions just to show you so 
Um, here as well, it does basic photo editing, uh, where you can actually just remove backgrounds. And again, you can do this on your um, free subscription too. So, and then you can actually download this and um, do other sorts of editing as well if you have got the premium one too. It's quite clever how it does that with AI, because uh, yeah, I can normally do that in Photoshop and spend about half an hour. Yeah. yeah. Thinking that the job's done just right at the minute. I know, I, I, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but I'd say um, it's really good for your super speedy assets that you need to make. Um, and then of course you have all of your popular templates on here too. Um, you'll see this small crown here is if you've actually got the premium access, but even without there, there are literally thousands of choices on here. And of course, the beauty is for being um, an online piece of software is constantly evolving. I constantly put new templates on for you to use. Um, you can also use this on your phone, which is great. So when you're on the go through the conference, you can take some pictures, get them uploaded, put them into a template. Um, it also links in with Premiere Rush, and Cassie is actually currently doing a workshop as well about how to make videos, which yep. I know you'll all be able to access after as well. And yeah, and of course at the bottom as well, I think it is, there's lots of things about Discover the Latest, there's tutorials, all sorts of things you can actually learn on here. So that's kind of the home dashboard if you like, but we'll go into sort of creating a project. This is where anything that you actually make um, would be stored here in, in sort of the project dashboard. You can then make folders as well, just like you would normally on a desktop and just drag things around and pop them in folders. So that's um, just really easy to just organize everything. This is the additional um, feature that you have if you do choose to be a premium subscriber. This is where you can actually upload your brand. Um, so just set one up here for Parry. You can also add additional logos. So if you're working with any partner organizations on a regular basis, you can pop them in here. Um, if, if you're not a premium user, you still can upload obviously a logo. You upload it as a photo, but you have to literally do it each time. So it can feel a little bit more laborious. Um, you can add your own color palettes and then also the fonts that you would use all the time. So we've obviously uploaded Noto here, which is the SKA font. Okay, and then in your libraries um, part of the uh, dashboard, this is where you can actually either create a library. So this is the library that we've actually created that we've put out to public links. So you can use all of these and you can then actually make your projects and your assets from this library. We've just, for the purpose of the conference, um, put together some templates for social media because we just felt that would be the easiest thing to experiment with and also a great way to sort of share whatever you create and I'm sure Joe and Cassie will be uh, retweeting and resharing things. So um, on here are some templates for Insta and an Instagram story. And then we've got some Facebook ones as well. And one of these templates is actually very much in line with these boards that you're going to see floating around the conference, which are science communication is, where everybody's being encouraged to put their own thoughts on. So you'll be able to write on these That's boards. Outrageous outreach. Yeah. yeah. So these are being used for the photo opportunity. So you'll be seeing Paul snapping, taking lots of pictures of these boards. But if you want to make use of these um, templates as well, you can do. So I quickly, I'm going to just quickly show you how to use one of these templates then. So if you have this uploaded in your library, oh, very quickly as well, there is also a schedule feature to um, premium users, which is super helpful if you want to make lots of social assets and you can actually schedule them to go into the calendar if you want to send them out at a certain time of day. But we'll just make a, um, an example template here from the Instagram one. So this is the template that would actually pre-upload. Now, if you didn't have this template and you wanted to make something from scratch, you could um, just add your own background from all the different backgrounds that are on here or upload your own or literally just start with a blank canvas as well. So um, just to give you a quick idea of some of the features, this is how you just super easy if you want to upload a photo. Say you see a really 
um, great key speaker um, during the conference and you, you're taking some pictures and you want to share, share that picture, you can obviously just drag and drop just like you would in any other uh, piece of software. But you can then use down the right hand side, that's where you'll find all your sort of editing tools, for what you can do. So take, for example, on this one, you might want to place the image into a circle um, and then increase the size of the picture within the circle. Again, super easy to use once you've made any changes that you want to. There's honestly tons of different shapes, sizes, everything, everything available. Uh, you just click your small tip tool and then you can move this about on the page. I'm doing this super rough, so I'm probably breaking all the principles that uh, Joe and Mars has just spoken about, just showing you this. I know, um, please don't <laughs> score me for this. Um, uh, so it's just literally to show you the ideas of how you can add something. Text again, um, you can literally just add your own text and edit it or You'll see also there's plenty of uh, different options to choose something that's already been pre-designed that will upload it into that style. You can select any of these um, like this and then drag it around. You can change this text, you can change the font if you want to, but we're not going to use that. Whoops. Uh, oh, helpful tool, your undo tool, which is at the top, which let's face it, I need to use a lot. So we'll just delete this and we're just going to put um, some text on here. It's very easy again to use. You just double click it to edit it. Um, you can just pop some text in here, maybe a inspirational quote that you've heard your speaker say. And again, you can change the color. You can, if you select the color palette and you have got your brand colors uploaded, they'll, they'll pop up for you. Um, you can pick your fonts. So I'll pick our brand fonts here. And then you can actually change your point size if you want to on the side, or you can just drag it about. And then another feature to add to these sort of like all different types is actually shapes and icons. And you can have a good look through this. There's absolutely loads to choose from. There's search tools as well. So we're going to pop in a speech bubble on this one. Um, just search for speech bubble, gives you lots of choices. And you can just literally just pick one here. And if you want to use a speech bubble, again, it just drops it in. You can change the color. So let's just change this to white. And there's also, um, just gonna just change that. There's a flip tool actually, that's handy to use. You can maybe just use the flip tool. You can just pop it on like this. You can drag it about. And in fact, let's fill that with the purple. And you can also um, change the border color as well. So you can change that maybe to white, you can change the thickness of your border, you can literally edit it as many times as you want to. Of course, that's now covered our text, but this small little layer order palette here is where you can actually change your layers of everything. So you might want to bring that back up. Hang on, this is where I don't forget how to do everything. So I'm going to change that actually to white as well. So, yeah, please apologize. Uh, uh, I apologize. This is obviously not the best design, but uh, Martin will be giving me a terrible score for this. But it just gives you the principles. So, obviously, you can spend plenty of time sort of um, adding more text, doing whatever you need to do. So, I'm just going to say maybe just pop on here the name of the speaker. So, let's just say Jane. Sorry, I can't type under pressure either. So there you go. And I literally uh, just shrink this down. I feel like uh, I should have used blue piece one. I showed you one from before. So, okay. And then um, you'll see as well when you drop things around that these blue guidelines, I don't know how clearly you can see them, they actually help snap things to make them center aligned and sort of use a bit of a grid format. 
So I'll just show you very quickly one more feature because I know um, we're pressed for time. Yeah. And we literally over here as well, you have actually got an animation feature as well. If you want to get really creative and do some animated GIFs via social media, um, you can actually use these different features for say text or even for life. Um, so different features like this where things pop on. It obviously does make it more um, sort of attention grabbing when you have a little bit of motion. You might even just want to do a slight zoom with your photos or something, but lots and lots of things that you can play with. And then of course, when you finally finished it and you're happy with it, and it would look far better than this is, you can then actually either download it. So you've got your download feature here, um, if you have done something with animation, it does give you the video choice. Without the animation, it will just be PNG, JPEG or, J or, or PDF. Or you might just want to go straight to share and then you can literally publish it immediately to your social media. Um, or of course, you can actually email it if you need somebody to check it or just grab a link for it and share it that way. So this that was a real whistle stop tour for how to make an asset in Adobe Express, but um, hopefully it gives you a bit of an idea of the accessibility of using a piece of online software that's actually free as well. So, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll show you the, um, the actual uh, library of assets so you can, of course, have a play. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Kate. Obviously, yeah, uh, push for time, but you did a brilliant, brilliant job in the time you had. So, um, We'll quickly open it up for some questions, but feel free to ask any more questions on the Slack channel as well during the conference, and we will answer every one of them as well. Uh, so anyone online or in the room have any questions so far? I've got a question for you guys. What do you all do in your individual roles? Do, you, do any of you actually do any design as such? Okay. What in, and what applications do you use? We use in design. Okay. Yeah. I use Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop. I wouldn't say particularly well. Okay, that's good. <laughs> but I use all three. Best software. That's good. Yeah, we use the same here, and they tend to be the, the best tools. But as someone mentioned uh, the about in the chat, that yeah, Adobe is developing some crazy useful tools. I mean, things like Express, Express, and Casty next door with uh, Adobe Rush, which is yeah. yeah slim down version of Premiere Pro, but it's amazing what um, how easy it is to do it these days. And so there is a plethora of tools out there to, to help us all in a in a quite a short amount of time produce some really good content. Um, so I don't see any hands online either. So um, yeah I'll wrap it up because I know Matt wants us to uh, move over to uh, the next to the council chamber. But um, yeah thanks everyone for coming to work to the workshop. I hope it was very useful.